Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were one single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. But now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, we thank you for the time of spring and renewal and the beautiful weather, Lord. Lord, I pray that our time today would be a time of renewal. Lord, I pray you would be with Mark. I pray you would bless his study. Lord, I pray you would speak through him, speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray you would push away all the distractions of the world that we come in with. Lord, that our focus would be on you and your word, that you grant us open hearts and discerning minds, Lord. And then everything done here today will be for your glory and our good. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, so we get to dig into God's word again. We get to try to understand what is Paul getting at, what is God getting at for the Corinthian church through Paul, and then what does that have to do with us today, or how does that apply to our lives today? And so um, my hope is today as we leave here that we would understand ourselves individually, but also who we are as a church, and be encouraged, but also to be convicted if need be, of the importance of each one of us individually as, as a church, that we are one body made up of many members. Uh, the Corinthian church as we've worked through the last number of chapters, the Corinthian church seems to be struggling to be unified as a body of believers. Throughout his letter, he's pointed out from the beginning. In chapter one, he talked about their divisive behavior when it comes to who they were listening to. That is when they said, well, I follow Paul or Apollos or I follow Cephas or I follow Christ. Whether or not they eat food offers to idol, offered to idols, what authority have been placed and distributed within the church, blurring the clear line of distinction between the sexes, or how to eat the Lord's Supper, and then ultimately the diversity of gifts that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, today's passage, Paul continues with the issue of spiritual gifts, but he focuses primarily on the God-intended spiritual health of the church. Now, again, the tendency is to go ask the question, what is, what is prophecy? 
What is speaking in tongues? Okay, we're going to get to some of that stuff later on in the chapters, but his main focus is not, what is this gift? His main focus is on the health of the church, the unity of the church. And he does this through two main truths. One is that the church is one body with many members, which he says probably a gazillion times in this passage. (laughs) So it's important. And secondly, that the church is a body purposely arranged by God. And he says that three times or a form of it three times in this passage. If the church is able to grasp and to strive to live faithfully with these truths in mind, then they will be more spiritually healthy. They will be more faithful in obedience to their Lord, just as God had intended them to be. So in this, in this, in short, this passage is a sort of spiritual well check for the church. And like going to the doctor for a physical, which we all love, right? Especially at the very end, uh, and you're a bunch of liars. Somebody said yes, you're all liars. Because nobody likes to hear what the doctor has to say at the end. Well, you know, you could stand to lose him a little more weight. Oh, you could stand to stop eating so much uh, red meat. Uh, you need to cut back on your salt or whatever it may be. He always, the doctor always says something at the end, right? So we may be hearing things. And as the church, we may be confronted just as the Corinthian church was with stark truths about its spiritual health. So that's not to lay blame and say, but we are a super unhealthy church. I don't think we are. I think this is a reminder and and a warning for us to make sure that we continue to be healthy spiritually. I mean, it'd be great if we went to the doctor and he said, everything's great. All your your blood levels, uh, sugar levels, everything is good. And it's, well, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. And that's, that's kind of the hope. And as he says, now make sure... You watch out, don't have too much, too much Panera on Sunday mornings, all right? Just have it every once in a while, and you're good. Like those, that's what I'm hoping that we're going to hear today, that we'll be able to evaluate ourselves as a church, but be able to step back and say, these are going really what well. we need to continue moving forward in this way, both individually, but also as a body. So Paul describes the local church in Corinth as a body with many members, a concept which is seen in the physical body. And so he, he makes this transition. He, he says, we're one body with many members as it is with Christ. And then he starts to use the illustration of the body. And then it blurs all of a sudden. He shifts it. It goes into the church itself. So when all the members of the physical body are working in unity, when they're doing what they were made to do, the whole body works as one. That makes sense, right? But if any part of the body is unable to do what it was created to do, the whole body suffers and its unity is damaged. So if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less part of the body. And if the whole body was an eye, then where would be uh, the ability to, to hear? Or if the whole body was an ear, then where would be the sense of smell? See, there's, there's no part of the body that can say to another, I have no need of you or I am not worthy to be in the body because all parts of the body are vital for its overall health. Yes, the body can adjust should the eyes or the ears stop working, but the body works most smoothly as it was designed if all of its parts are healthy, and are working together. That's why we go to the doctor. That's why we try to eat healthy. That's why we try to exercise more. That's, that's why we love spring. We can get out and be more active. If we had no feet, there would be no walking. If we had no mouth, there would be no talking. If we had no ear, there would be no hearing. A broken toe affects the, the rest of the foot, which then affects the leg, which affects the back, which then affects the neck. It's all tied together. Hey, little kids, you, get, you, you don't get that. You will. You will. You'll wake up in the morning, you'll be like, wait, what? My foot hurts. Oh, my neck hurts within a day, right? 
if all of the parts, of the, well, all of the parts of the body, no matter how small, no matter how seemingly insignificant, all of them are important to the health of the whole. Now, this is a concept that we see everywhere around us. Take a guitar, for instance. I won't, I won't lift it up. I won't touch, won't, won't touch your guitar. It's all right. If there were no strings on the guitar, you would not be able to hear any notes because no notes could be played. If a few frets were broken, you know what a fret is? Yeah, okay, fine, I'll grab it. Okay, the, the strings are a major part of the guitar, right? Like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You don't have strings, then you don't have any notes. But these little things right here, these little metal things going across, uh, those are called frets. You get rid of those frets, it's going to sound different. And unless you have a professional mu musician, it ain't going to sound good at all. And if you only have one fret missing, then all the other notes are going to sound great. But you're going to have that one note that never quite sounds right, and it's going to ruin the entire song. Every musician says, yes, that makes sense, right? If one peg which holds the screws in place or the strings in place down at the bottom. One peg is broken. Well, the string is unable to be played. And instead of six strings, you got five strings, which is possible to play with, but it just doesn't sound quite right. It affects the sound of the guitar. The tuning peg at the top, which Aaron had to fix, right? Did you see him? He tuned it because it was out of tune. That, if that peg breaks... And that string is out of tune constantly. It ruins the entire song. And it's difficult to not only play, it's difficult to listen to. So when every part of the guitar, though, is working properly, just as it was designed, the guitar accomplishes, it what, accomplishes what it was created to do, and that is to make beautiful music. You can see that with everything. Things in your house. The refrigerator, if there's no light, that's a small thing, but then you can't see what's inside the refrigerator. So you've got to turn other lights on and it causes inconvenience. Anything that you can think of in life, if one piece of it breaks, none of you understand that to yesterday, uh, Nathan and Albert and Denny went around to all the chairs and put screws in the chairs so that you wouldn't fall off the chair because it's not attached anymore to the metal. Okay, when it's, when those screws are, just little tiny screws, when they're gone, you're on the floor or you're just moving around a lot. It doesn't accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. But if that screw is fixed, if everything is there as it's supposed to be, then the chair functions what it's, as it's supposed to function. Does that all make sense? Okay. And so this is how it is with the body of Christ. This is how it is with the church. Every individual in the church is vital to its overall spiritual health. The members, which appear to be weaker, are actually indispensable. And the less honorable members, those who appear to be less important to the health of the church, they are actually shown greater honor. Now, ultimately, what he points to, he says, this is not a greater honor just necessarily from the church to those, those less, less honorable members. I'm using that in quotation marks. This greater honor is ultimately shown by God because in verse 18, he says, the body is arranged by God just as he had chosen it to be. He brings honor to those members of the church which nobody or very few people understand of what they're doing. He says in verse 24, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Three times he states that God is the source of the body of Christ. He arranged its members. He composed the body. He appointed the gifts within the church. And so the church is made of one body and is united together by God. Or as Paul says in verse, th verse 13, by the one spirit. So whether you are Jew or Greek, slave or free, all, 
within the church in Corinth are one through Christ. God has created the church in Corinth precisely as he intended it to be. And so, if God is the one who is the church's creator, and he is the one who bestows greater honor on those within the church, then for the Corinthians to look down upon or to see others in the church as less important or less honorable is actually, and and I love this quote, this is from my Bible notes, It is actually to question God's authority to distribute the gifts as he sees fit within the church. It's to claim that God has made a mistake in the way that he has gifted the members of the church, which is a very dangerous position to hold. Because to take such a stance is to place oneself higher than God in the sense that you know better than the creator of the universe. And in essence, it is placing oneself in the position of God. That's where the danger comes in. Because there is only one God, and it ain't any of us. (laughs) He ain't us. There's only one God. And so the Corinthians were creating division within the body, treating some within the church with greater honor and others with lesser honor, seemingly denying or belittling those with gifts they saw as less important. And we see this in the church. Not, not necessarily here. I, I mean, it probably is happening. I'm sure if it's happening in your own heart, I mean, that's, that's up to you. But we, we see this in other churches. The, the pastor or the preacher or the teacher is lifted on a high pedestal. He or is the center of... of He's the face of the church, or he's the face of the ministry. Oh, if I could only be like that person right over there. Or even, even if, if something that's, that's not public, somebody who's able to donate a lot of money, and they're to beautify the church because the gift that God has given them is wealth and they're able to do that, but they're getting all the honor. And those people who can't give as much, whew, you know, they're just not as important. It comes in a lot of forms within the church. And in Corinth, in essence, in other words, they were being partial. They were being biased or prejudiced in favor of one gift or another. One of the main ways that you see this in the church, and seems it seems the evidence, although it's not directly said, the evidence seems to point to this, that if you can't speak in tongues, if you can't prophesy, whew, sorry, you're just, you're not quite there on the level of faith that I am. I've encountered that in, in churches. I am more faithful than you. I I pity you. May I bestow my wisdom and my faith upon you. It creates a prejudice in favor of one gift or over another. But Paul is trying to teach them that God has so composed the body of Christ that when it is healthy, when all of its members are using their spiritual gifts... The unity is so complete that if one member suffers, they all suffer. And if one member is honored, then they all rejoice together. Jealousy, partiality, and envy will not exist. Or at the very least, they will be very quickly shut down and extinguished. If the church truly is spiritually healthy, then it is able to fulfill its call to live as Christ lived, to love as Christ loved. And even though there's 2,000 years that separate us from them, God's word still holds true for us today. Yes, it's a different culture, it's a different time, it's a different place, it's a different situation, but the truths remain, remain the same. As Elm Creek, we are one body made up with many members And we are a body that God has created, that God has appointed. Elm Creek Community Church is united and bound together through God, composed of different members with varying gifts that are given from the Holy Spirit. 
We have teachers, we have preachers, elders, servers, those who administrate, singers, prayer warriors, toilet washers. Yeah, agreed. But it's got to be done. We have them. We have, we have people who do the dirty work and we laugh, right? But who wants to come to a church with a dirty toilet? Can I say toilet to what, three times now in a sermon? Nobody. But when it's not done, we see it, do we not? When it's completed and it's done and it's done with joy. Even cleaning a bathroom can bring unity to the body. Especially when done with joy and love and care. There are no unimportant members here at Elm Creek. Yes, some gifts are more public than others, but all are important for the spiritual health of the whole body of Christ. And so as the body is in need of the ear or the eye, so Elm Creek is in need of each one of us. But that also means that we forever must be humble. <laughs> Realizing that this body has been arranged and composed and appointed by God. He is the center. He has appointed and arranged Elm Creek exactly as it needs to be composed. Or I should say, as we need to be composed for right now. With exactly the people that he desires for this time. Now, if you've been a part of this church, if you've been a part of any church... There's ebb and flow, right? God moves people out. God brings people in. That Those people who are here need to be here for this time, at this time, for this reason. God has appointed you to be here. No more, no less. So if God has chosen you to be part of Elm Creek, then he has ordained for you to use your God-given spiritual gift or gifts to unify the church so that we may become more spiritually healthy and striving to be more faithful to him. But that also means that if you are withholding your gift or if you are procrastinating to discover your spiritual gift, which means you're not using your spiritual gift, then you are like the foot which says, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. God has called you to be part of Elm Creek. And so, as a body, may we learn from the Corinthians and do not question God's authority of distributing gifts as he sees fit. A healthy church body is a faithful and spiritually growing church body. Can I say that again? Because a lot of times I think we get confused by this. We think that a healthy church body is one that is bursting at the seams. That we got we to gotta build on or we got to start another church. And those are massive blessings that God can do to us, to any church. That is not necessarily a sign of spiritual health. A healthy, truly healthy church body is a faithful body of Christ and is a spiritually growing church body, spiritually growing in our faith and our understanding of who God is. And a unified body which sees all members as honorable, no matter their gifting, is a church body that is going to glorify God, which is ultimately what we're called to do. And so just as we are called individually to glorify God in our bodies, Paul says that uh, in chapter 6, I believe, so the body of Christ is to do the same. And so are we here at Elm Creek, are we united? Yes, I, I believe we are. Again, we're not perfect. We're not perfect, individually or as a body. But I do see many using their gifts to serve God. I have, have had conversations with 
a, a few people where they say, well, I don't know my gifts. All right, let's, let's have that conversation. But those who are using their gifts are serving God and helping us to strive to become more and more faithful and obedient to God. As we say this a lot when, um, when Aaron and I meet and we talk about the worship service, one of the main things we say is, is it a distraction to the gospel and to the glory of God? Using our gifts so that something is accomplished or something is done in such a way that nobody knows it's happening means that it is no longer a distraction. That thing is no longer a distraction. And so we can focus completely upon worshiping and glorifying God and serving Him. But I want to speak directly to the kids and to the youth here at Elm Creek. Sometimes you may think that this Sunday morning thing is actually applicable only to the adults. That's a generalization, so don't send me any emails. But I want, I want you to hear this. You are valuable to us as a church. You are valuable. And then to the older generation, there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. And as a member of the body of Christ here at Elm Creek, you are valuable and important to us as a church. And to everybody in between, you are valuable to us as a church. If you are a child of God, if you have repented of your sins, if you have turned to God's grace and mercy and trusted in Jesus Christ as the Savior, treasure, and Lord of your life. Savior in that I need my sins saved. I need to be saved from my sins because you're going to hold those against me, God. So Christ has saved me, and I, I believe that. Treasure as in God is, Christ is the most important thing in your life. As you're striving to be more and more obedient to him, which means he's your Lord, which means if he commands me to do something, man, I want to follow him. I want to follow him and do what he asks. And I want to grow in that and be better and more faithful to him and obedient to him. If that is true for you, then God has given you a spiritual gift. If you are a believer and you're six years old, you have a spiritual gift. If you're a believer and you're 90 years old, you have a spiritual gift. If you're 42 years old and you're a believer in Christ, you have a spiritual gift. And he is calling you, so kids, adults, older adults, hear this. God is calling you to use to your gift to make us healthier as a body of Christ. You, even at six years old, can serve God by serving the church and using your gift. So, do you know your spiritual gift? If you're, if you're a youth today, if you're a kid today, and you're like, I have no idea. The beauty is, is you have parents sitting right next to you. You could go home today. You have that conversation. If they refuse to listen to you, come and talk to me. I'll have a conversation with them. And then we'll have a conversation together. It's not to get anybody in trouble, okay? This is just, we want you to know your spiritual gift. We want you to strive to figure that out. Do you know how God has gifted you? Do you know what God has appointed you to at Elm Creek. You hear that? He has appointed you. If this is your home church, he has appointed you specifically to serve him here using your gifts. Now, this is not a guilt trip. This isn't a plea to try to get people to do more. It's an exhortation. That's just a really great biblical word, which just means to urge. I urge you, I exhort you to use your gifts as God has intended. Because we are a healthier body when all of us who belong to Christ are united in the task of glorifying God and being faithful to him in all that we do. And so may may be true for us that when one member suffers, we all suffer. And when one member is honored, 
that we all rejoice together and give praise and glory to the one who created us, who appointed us to be here at this time, at this place. Because that is what happens in spiritually healthy churches. A church that is made up of many different members, united together through Christ as one body for his glory, for his honor and for his praise, and not ours as a church or as an individual. May we as God's people maybe have a little spiritual well check and check our hearts and serve and love as God has called us to. Father, I pray that you would help us as your body, as your people. You have created us individually for a specific purpose, with specific gifts. You have brought us together, all these different backgrounds, all these these different personalities, all these different members to work together as one to glorify you. Father, we, we are a healthy church. But God, we, want to, we don't want to stop there. We want to become more healthy. And those, those areas, Lord, where maybe we're struggling, I pray you would raise people up so that we can become more healthy. So that ultimately, Father, we could glorify you and not ourselves. Help us, help us to check our egos at the door and the, that we would serve you with joy because you have brought us here for a reason to glorify you, to praise you, to serve you, and to spread your gospel. Father, help us as your church. Make this true for us more and more each day, each week, individually, but also as a whole body, Father. That we'd be able to stand before you and you would speak the words to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Make this true for us. More and more each day, Father, we ask this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our final song?